Okay, so we can start again, and I'm very pleased to introduce Brian, who will uh, speak about confidence and belief and decision making. Please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation and for organizing this uh, very interesting um, workshop. So, um, <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about is in slight continuity with some of the stuff we've seen this morning and yesterday. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, decision making uh, kind of in the light of lots of things that have happened in the last 20 years and that were summarized in five minutes. Um, but uh, just before I'll situate uh, what I'll be saying in a slightly larger philosophical project on the representation of belief. Uh, once again, the, the idea is to consider the question of what uh, should be an appropriate representation of belief of a rational agent, once again, in the light of some of the challenges, criticisms of the standard uh, Bayesian model. So no better place to start, or well, let's say the second base place to start, given that I'm here uh, in Italy, is with a quote by uh, Ramsey. I couldn't find an appropriate quote by a better place to start. Um, uh, this is from the beginning of Truth and Probability, the paper on which uh, he sets out one of the first representation theorems. I don't know how one of the first representation theorems uh, in which he's going to defend the Bayesian probabilistic representation of belief. And what I'm going to be taking issue with in this quote, so once again, this, this part is typically philosophical and therefore very pernickety, I'll be taking issue with the an in the an order of magnitude. Okay, the, the smallest word in the whole quote or equal, at least, with us. Um, and uh, I won't be the first. And before uh, Ramsey was even writing, we have uh, Charles Santos Pierce, more than 30 years ago, suggesting to express a proper state of belief, not one, but two numbers are required, the second one being the amount of knowledge. A quote for economists, we have Frank Knight, 10 years before Ramsey, or not 10 years, probably around five years, given. Um, suggesting that there's not only the estimate, but the probability that that estimate is correct, where when Knight uses the term probability, he doesn't mean it in the same sense that we use it. And we've got similar ideas in Keynes. We even have a famous passage in the Foundations for Statistics where Savage suggests that, says that there seems to be some probability, there's an intuition that there seems to be some probability measures about which we feel relatively more sure, inverted commas, as compared to others. Okay? Uh, and the idea here, it seems, is that uh, beyond the degree to which one endorses a particular proposition, there is the degree to which one is confident in the endorsement. The, beyond what philosophers call the degree of belief or beliefs or uh, credences, there's a degree to which one is confident in those degrees of belief or beliefs or credences. Okay? So if the first thing are one's beliefs, this we should probably call one's confidence in beliefs. Um, and the general idea is that both of these are, of course, subjective elements, elements of the agent's belief, and they, together they make up the agent's state of belief, or what I'll call doxastic state. So this is not going to be kind of one difference from the previous talk. This is not going to be talk about subjective uh, beliefs over objective chances or objective probabilities. This is, we're going to be 100% subjective here. Uh, so the, the claim of the general background project is that this second dimension, which is ignored by Ramsey, uh, this confidence in Direct dimension is an important aspect that must be taken into account in any reasonable normative theory, any reasonable theory of a rational agency. Okay? And as kind of Richard suggested, you, there, there are relatively two ways you can go around trying to defend this claim. Corresponding to the two roles that beliefs play in our lives, right? So one role is uh, in trying to represent the world as well as possible, incorporating any form of information we have. So confidence and belief may have a role to play in belief formation. Okay? Uh, and some of the quotes I had give you that impression, you know, amount of information, amount of knowledge, amount of evidence are sometimes terms used for the second dimension. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about here. This is a, a conference or a workshop, after all, on uh, games and decisions. So I'll be talking about the role of confidence in choice. Okay? So one way to defend the claim I had in the previous slide would be to try and show that confidence in belief does have a role to play in choice and say something specific about that role that, that, that has to play. Okay? Um, so once again, uh, just to kind of convince you that some people uh, um, kind of agree with the basic intuition, here's another citation by Knight saying that the action which falls upon an opinion depends as much upon the confidence you have in that opinion as the opinion itself. Okay? Um, now, but you don't have to take his word for it. There are several 
examples in which it seems like something like confidence, or one interpretation of the example, is that something like confidence might have a role to play. So standard one, which we've seen enough here, is the Ellsberg example. So one intuition, and we've seen other ones, and there are many others. We've seen another one this morning, and there are many others, is that this is a two, two on Ellsberg. You know this is basically, this is basically Fabio's 50-50 uh, coin toss, where you kind of know the probabilities between your sausage and your your candy, and this is the kind of game which you don't know the probabilities. And one intuition you can have is the reason why you prefer this to this. If you had to give a best guess about the probability here, you would say a, a half, but you're not very confident in that best guess, okay? Whereas you're much more confident here. So you can, you can find an intuition about confidence in Ellsberg. However, given there are many other explanations, many people, especially in the ambiguity, this is of course to flag the fact that I'll be talking about ambiguity uh, a little bit later. Many people in the ambiguity literature um, kind of suggest that it's not the best testing horse for ambiguity. So let's, you can think of other examples. Um, ones generally come, or kind of family, come from uh, choices that have to be based on incomplete or controversial scientific evidence where probability is difficult to be found. So choices based on, you know, our best climate models, for example. We, Keteris Paribus, it seems that, seems reasonable that we'd like uh, to base our policy decisions on a, kind of conclusions in which we're most confident, judgments in which we're most confident. And if there is some tentative conclusions in which we're not that confident, you can legitimately ask to what extent we should be basing our policy decisions on those. Okay? Uh, another, perhaps slightly more homely example, you can imagine an investor who invests in a startup drug company which has just developed a new drug. He's confident enough that that drug is going to be a success to invest in the company, but he would not allow that drug to be given to his daughter. He's not confident enough that that drug is a success to, um, to uh, administer it to his daughter. Okay? So that's one family. Another area in which confidence might be um, relevant is what I call the problem of deferral. Right? The problem, not the problem that some social epistemologists have treated of who you should defer to, but the problem of when you should defer. When should a middle manager defer a decision to um, his boss? When should a doctor defer a decision uh, or defer a patient to a specialist? When should a judge defer a decision to a higher court? Um, one intuition that you have is that a good reason for deferring, a good situation which you would defer, is because you just don't know. Ceteris paribus, once again, if you're less confident whatever judgment you would make if you had to make the decision, that seems to be a relatively good reason to defer. But as you may as well know, might well know, um, the standard economic analysis of this sort of question, if there are any, doesn't follow that intuition at all, right? And the only reason for, to defer is because you think there's some uh, difference in information between the information you have now and the information you would have if you deferred, or the information the person would have if you deferred, or he knows his utilities better than you do, or you would know your utilities if you defer to your future self better than you do now, etc., etc. right? Um, that intuition seems to be lost, and nevertheless, you have the idea that maybe confidence has a role. Okay? So hopefully this blurb, just as, a, as part of an introduction, would at least buy me uh, 40 or 50 minutes of your time to talk about uh, the role that confidence uh, might have to play in, in normative decisions. Okay, so let's start talking about that role. And the first question that comes to mind, of course, is fine. If I'm trying to defend the idea that confidence has a role, what role? What role? Well, let's consider the example of climate models. So if you consider the example of climate models, you might ask yourself whether we're happy with decisions on climate policy being taken on the best hunch estimates of some climate scientists. Okay, think for a second. It's just pretty sure that it, that's a probability that the temperature is going to rise after the climate. Okay? What do we think about these climate scientists using their best hunch estimates at the bar after their conference to take wagers between themselves about the temperature in 20 years time. Similarly with a doctor, if a doctor is faced with a patient, he's relatively sure that patient's okay, but he's not, he's, I mean, he thinks there's a high probability that patient's okay, but he's not entirely sure should he defer the, expert, the decision to an expert. Does that kind of prevent him from wagering with another doctor that in fact the patient's gonna be fine? If you have the intuition that in the first question in each of these, it, you're a little bit less comfortable relying on beliefs on these best hunch estimates, whereas in the latter ones, it doesn't seem so bad to be taking bets 
uh, say, the evening at a, you know, the better bottle of Prosecco or a, or a pint of beer on these sorts of things, then there seems to be an intuition that when the decision is more important, when it's graver, when it's more serious, we'd want to be using beliefs in which we have more confidence. Whereas if the decision is less important, it's more trivial, if you will, we don't mind using beliefs in which we're less confident. To put it in, in terms of a maxim, it seems that relatively reasonable to say that the higher the stakes involved in the decision, the more confidence is required in a belief for it to play a role in that decision. Okay? And what I'm going to, my second claim, the main claim I'm going to be talking about in this talk is that this is a normative maxim for decision. Okay? Normative maxim for decision making, it should be part of any uh, reasonable normative theory uh, of decision. We're talking about normative theories here. It seems. And of course, if I manage to defend this as a normative maxim for normative theory of decision, then uh, I have managed to defend the idea that confidence should be playing a role in any representation of rational agency. Okay? Now, to do this, we're going to have to turn the, the kind of blurb we've started with into something a little bit more formal so we can start getting, looking, looking at the properties of, of this way of deciding and not. Right? So, the plan of the talk is relatively simple. I'm basically going to turn this kind of idea of confidence. I'm going to propose a model of confidence and beliefs. I'm going to propose a family of decision rules which embody the maxim that I've just put on the board. And then I'm going to consider the conceptual and choice theoretic properties, mimicking what is often done for standard Savagian or Ramsian or definitive subjective probabilities and subjective utility. And then briefly, hopefully I have a little bit of time, I might talk about what this means for uh, decision making, particularly uh, kind of public decision making, big stakes decisions, severe uncertainty decisions. Okay. So, first thing to do. What I, the idea is uh, we want uh, any reasonable representation of belief to incorporate. Maybe what? Yeah, sure. Sorry. So it's it's just um, about your example. So just to kind of get the sort of sense of the map of where you're going. So uh, in both of those cases, one might think that what's a, what you're worried about is the variance in the outcomes that are contingent on the probabilities that you're working with. So when you wager a bottle of prosecco. Uh -huh get it wrong, you don't get the Prosecco. Yeah. Um, in the, but if you, if you misdiagnose, the patient dies. Um, so even if, you know, there needn't be any difference in the, in the probabilities that you're using to make these decisions for you to regard the decisions as fundamentally, there being something fundamentally different at stake here. And the, the, the sort of intuition would just be where the stakes matter to... Sure. Okay. Um, but then you could just take a kind of slightly more... Um, sophisticated version of those sorts of examples where, so suppose you take the patient example, right? Or just take a very, very simple example. Suppose you're going to have a 50-50 bet on, oh no, you're going to have a bet on a particular event, right? So that'd be a very stereotyped version of the patient example. Uh, and suppose you could, uh, suppose you have the utility, you've managed to get the person's utility function. Suppose he would have plus a thousand if the event happens and minus a thousand if the event doesn't happen, right? Uh, and now consider a similar bet on the event where the utility values are plus one and minus one. Uh, then you can't capture this in the utility. I, I'm, I'm, I was kind of in the middle of the, the, the fluffy examples, but basically if I had to kind of do a more, less fluffy version, I would have to factor out the utility, of course, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so first thing, let's, let's propose a model of confidence and beliefs. And, um, Perhaps the first stopping point would be one of the first jumps that people take when they want to go beyond the representation of beliefs as a single belief. Something's already been, already been uh, mentioned, the kind of idea of representing beliefs by sets of probability measures, a la lots of people. Good, I have a list here. Good Smith, Levi, Gabor, Schmeidler, Bewley, Joyce, Wally, or just to mention a few. Okay? Uh, and you can consider this sort of representation as a representation of confidence. It's not generally considered in this way for reasons that are going to be clear in a second. You could say that to any set of probability measures, you can associate a set of probability judgments. That is sentences of the form, judgments of the form, the probability of A is greater than 0.3 or something like that. Right? That set of probability judgments is, of course, a set of probability judgments that hold for all probability measures in the set. And you can say you're confident in those probability judgments, you're confident in the judgment if it holds everyone in the set, and you're unsure about the judgment if it does not hold it in the same. Okay? So it's kind of relatively simple. Uh, of course, this gives you a representation of confidence, but a representation is in it that's evidently inadequate because it's binary. 
you're either, for every probability judgment, you're either confident in it or you're unsure about it. Okay. Or you're confident that you don't hold it. Uh, whereas in reality, we get this idea that confidence comes in degrees. I said it's another dimension. Blah, blah, blah. So we're going to take the next complicated thing up. We're going to be as simple as possible, but we're going to have to have something a little bit more complicated. So instead of a set of probability measures, I would take a nested family of sets of probability measures. Okay? So the idea is the following. Each set in this nested family can be thought of as corresponding to a level of confidence. Okay? Uh, to each set in a nested family, you can assign a set of probability judgments of the form the probability of A is greater than or equal to 0.3, etc. Right? Those are the probability judgments which hold for all probability measures in the set. Okay? Larger sets correspond to higher levels of confidence. If the set of probability measures is larger, fewer probability, measure, fewer probability judgments hold everywhere in that set. That corresponds to the fact that you hold fewer probability judgments to that higher level of confidence. The more confidence you are interested in, the fewer probability judgments you hold to that level of confidence. Okay? That immediately, of course, gives you a, a relative ranking. You can say that you're more confident in one probability judgment than another. If the former probability judgment holds uh, for all probability measures in more sets than the latter, i.e. the former probability judgment holds to a larger confidence level than the latter one does, okay? And you get rid of this problem of binariness. And if in words that was a little bit fast, we can do the same thing in pictures, right? So if you think of the board as being your space of probability measures, right? So each point is a probability measure. This is the standard Gil Bohr, Schmeidler, good, blah, 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 representation as a single set of probability measures. And what I'm, what I'm proposing diagrammatically is something a little bit like this, the nested family of sets, okay? So this representation, uh, you could, for each probability judgment, it can have several kind of statuses in this representation. The agent could not hold the judgment. So this is a judgment that the agent does not hold because it, is not, it does not hold, it's not true for all probability measures in any of these sets. So this is a smaller set, does not hold it. Okay. This is a probability judgment that the agent does hold. He does endorse it. It does hold for all probability measures in one of the sets, but uh, it's one that he endorses with a relatively low level of confidence because it only holds in a small set. This is one that he holds with a larger level of confidence. So we can say that he's more confident in this than this. Okay. Um, so a uh, little point to kind of Refer, kind of, to put this in a context that some people might see, this uh, logicians might uh, recognize as Lewis Sphere's model uh, for counterfactuals or the Gross Sphere model for belief revision related to the sort of non-classical logics, not too dissimilar from the sort of, sort of thing that Heichel was talking yesterday, except that they never work on spaces of probability measures, which adds an awful lot of continuity problems, but the idea is not too dissimilar. Okay? Um, of course, this is supposed to be an entirely subjective representation, so we're not going to tell someone what their thing is. But if you were a statistician and you wanted to build one of these on the basis of data, for example, it's not impossible to do so by considering these to be the probability measures inside confidence intervals. So this would be a large confidence interval. These ones would be small confidence intervals. If you were a macroeconomist and you wanted to build one of these, then you could, for example, take a best guess or reference probability and take these to be the sets of probability measures having statistical distance less than particular bounds. Say, for example, this would be the one with relative entropy difference between the, the, the probability measures less than a certain amount. This would be relative entropy less than a, a bigger amount, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So it's not easy, it's not difficult to construct things like this sort of sort if you, if you wanted to. Um, and this sort of beast I'm going to call a confidence ranking. It's a nested family of closed subsets. Um, uh, closure is relatively standard. Throughout this talk, I'm going to assume convexity. If there were more philosophers in the room, I would have to add some kind of excuse for, for, for looking at convexity because it's a relatively controversial property, given we're mainly economists. We know that if we're doing preference revelation, as I will do later, convexity basically comes out as, as obvious. Um, I'm going to be assuming a continuity property, which is relatively, um, relatively self-explanatory. It basically says if you are confident, if at a particular confidence level you think the probability of an event is between, say, 0.3 and 0.7, at the next confidence level up, you're not suddenly going to jump up to having a probability interval between 0.1 and 0.9. Um, and I just note this is something that's not going to be assumed, it's basically modular in any of the axiomatizations, um, that you can, a special case of this is a case where you have a singleton set, where you have a single Boolean, you have a single probability in the middle. This would be the case of a best guess in the realm of entropy if you want to get a concrete idea. And that's basically a Boolean, a, a Boolean. that's basically a Bayesian with confidence. Okay? Someone who can, who can give 
um, a unique probability value to every event, but he might not be very confident in most of those. Yeah, most of those. Uh, most of those. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, one final thing to say about this. This is, of course, an ordinal structure. It corresponds to weak order at the second level, right? Um, and as such, it's relatively simple. If you wanted to uh, give a logical axiomatization of this, uh, it, it's doable. It's quite complicated because you've got some sort of probability logic. Only doable. Um, if you wanted to get a decision maker to give you the information for this, all you need to do is to ask him whether he's more confident in one probability judgment than another. You don't have to ask him how much more confident he is in one than another. And this is a perhaps important difference between this model of, of beliefs, right, and beliefs and confidence beliefs, and other models which are used, for example, in the literature on, on, on decision and ambiguity, which usually, or of which many of the modern ones require some sort of cardinal structure at the second order level, such as second order sets of probabilities, which we already talked about, or some sort of real value function where the, the real value function doesn't have to be unique, but you need some sort of cardinal structure. Okay, okay so um, that's, our, that's our model of confidence and belief. That's what I'm gonna, the model I'm going to be trying to defend. And the idea is we want to be able to decide using this model. And we're going to try and use our maxim, right? Now I'm going to be lazy here. I've already come up with the idea. I'm just going to basically brute force formalize this maxim. So what does the maxim say? It says the higher the stakes involved in the decision, the more confidence is required in the belief for it, play, for it to play a role in that decision. So to a decision, I'm going to want to associate a level of confidence. A level of confidence corresponds to a set in that nested family of sets, right? So I'm going to want to somehow associate to a decision a level of confidence. I'm going to want to do so on the basis of the stakes. I'm not going to assume some sort of stakes function. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a function that to every decision will associate the appropriate level of confidence. Okay? That function is going to be a subjective element, a subjective attitude, if you want, of a decision maker. And we're going to be talking about it quite a bit at the end of this talk. Right? I'm going to call it a cautiousness coefficient. And it has to embody somehow the maximum that higher the stakes and more confidence. So it's going to be assumed to respect the stakes. For higher stakes, we're going to take higher confidence levels, which correspond, as I said, to bigger sets in this nested family. Okay? To write that down formally, I'm going to assume a relation of stakes between decisions, of which I'm going to say something in a second. Okay? Note that all I've done in this brute force formalization of the maximum is I've just kind of specified the way in which you connect the decision to the level of confidence appropriate for it. I have not said anything about how you choose yet. So what I've, in fact, defined is not a single decision model, but a family of decision models. Okay. Let's just say what that family is. Each element of the family is going to have three uh, subjective elements, three elements, three subjective parameters, bits of kind of attitudes of a decision maker of some sort or an, uh, and another, and I'm going to be talking about those later. So one is a utility function, confidence ranking, representation of beliefs and confidence and beliefs, and this caution, this coefficient. And each one's going to tell you, suppose that these these objects of choice are Savage Axe or Anscombe Almond Axe. Fabio has already said everything that needs to be said about those uh, ever. Uh, and uh, uh, Richard has also already mentioned them, so I don't have to tell you more, more about what they are. Each member of the family says that preferences concerning Axe are a function of the utility of the consequence given, a particular, given, the, given the choice of the act of a particular state. And this set of, probabil set of probability measures, which has been singled out by a cautionless coefficient, Right? according to some decision rule. Uh, different members of the family differ along two dimensions. One is the decision rule. Take this different decision rules, you have different members of the family. The other one is this notion of stakes, okay? which, is, uh, which is respected by D and about which I've said nothing. Okay? If I, I, I take the notion of stakes to be separate because I think it's part of the decision rule. If you want, in certain consequences, in certain um, uh, contexts, it can be endogenized. In, endogenize, right? If you, if you would just like endogenizing everything, you can endogenize, right? But that's not the word, approach I'm going to take here. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of how wide this family is, as your decision rules, you can take anything involving somewhere or another sets of probability. So you can take the unanimity rule, that's the, the one associated with Bewley, you prefer one act to another. If it's got a high expect, higher expected utility according to all uh, probability measures in the set, you can take the max min expected utility rule, which has already been mentioned, you take the, the worst expected utility. You can take some alpha max min rule, you can take, if you're a philosopher and you like Levi, you can take the admiss easy admissibility rule, etc., 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 whatever that, that requires. Even more. 
sophisticated versions of these. Okay? And as stakes, basically, the sky is more or less your limit as well, right? You can associate stakes to acts individually, the, stake involved, the, the, the stakes involved in that particular bet, for example. You might say it's the worst thing that can happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's an intuition that Richard had in the example of the doctor. Um, uh, you can associate stakes to uh, pairs of acts. If you're thinking about binary choices, you might say, well, no, I want to associate stakes to, to, to the pair of acts. Uh, and you can extend any of these and think of other notions of stakes. You can associate stakes to whole menus if you're not interested in binary choices or you want to move beyond the preference paradigm. You can associate uh, stakes um, to menus even involving some sort of context parameter if you think the status quo or the current wealth level of some sort of reference point might be, um, a pr might, might be relevant for the stakes, you can add that all in. Basically, in what follows, I'm assuming some very basic properties about stakes, like some sort of kind of extensionality, of the, a, bit, a very minimal form of continuity, but there's not really much that needs to be assumed. Okay. That's our decision rule, or our family of decision rules. Uh, now I'm going to want to look at some of the properties of that. I'm going to want to see if I can at least do my best to try and evaluate whether this really could be a good theory, a good normative theory, or an appropriate normative theory of decision. Um, so before doing that, perhaps we should start with a list of some things we'd like a good theory, good appropriate normative theory of decision. Some properties we'd like a good appropriate normative theory of decision to have, right? So a quick perusal of uh, the literature on normative defense, defenses of normative defenses of decision rules, uh, invariably the expected utility rule, seems to suggest that there are three sorts of things which have been suggested. Okay? So one idea that people often use to defend expected utility is that it corresponds to some reasonable pre-theoretical or pre-technical intuition. Right? You're mixing outcomes with probabilities. That sounds like the sort of thing that your grandmother might even accept. Okay? Um, another stronger and, let's say, more well-worn way of defending expected utility rule is by looking at strong theoretical consequences. So, Dutch book arguments can convince you should be probabilistic. Uh, representation theorems of the sort we've seen yesterday, which basically give you, tell you precisely what the properties are that correspond, are necessary and sufficient for you to choose in that way. If you like those properties, that would be a good reason for you to choose that way. Um, a little bit kind of a step beyond, there are a whole bunch of dynamic consistency arguments, which are specifically kind of proposed to defend particular ones of those properties, in particular the independence property, the sure thing principle, which corresponds precisely to the expected utility. Right? That, the idea is that the choice of the kind of the option of not being expected utility and kind of ends up being very, very costly in terms of dynamic consistency requirements. Um, and finally, sometimes it's suggested that one nice thing about the expected utility model is that it's got conceptual clarity. We think we have desires, we think we have beliefs. The desires in the model correspond to utilities, the beliefs in the model correspond to probabilities. We see how they go together, we see what they mean. That sounds clear. Okay. I'm not saying that I'm convinced or I even think that any of these are particularly good ways of defending a model. The important thing is that they've been used to defend models. Let's see if we can do a similar thing here. Right? Let's see what the, what's kind of, what, where, where, what our model has to envy the decision, uh, the standard Bayesian model for. Okay? So um, what I've done is I've proposed a family. So I'm going to defend the family. That doesn't mean defending each and every member of the family, because if you take a stupid decision rule and you mix it with a silly notion of stakes, you're ever going to find something which is ridiculous. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to defend reasonable members of the family. I'm going to take two members, and I'm going to try and show that on the base, these two members don't do too badly on this, on this score, and then we're going to, I'm going to kind of suggest by some, some strange form of mysterious induction that general members, there's no reason to think that we don't have, we can't get the same. Okay? So first thing, reasonable pre-technical pre intuition. Let's, let's consider two members. A member of the family corresponds to plugging in a decision rule and a notion of stakes. So let's take that unanimity decision rule and any notion of stakes that applies to pairs of acts. So basically our model looks like this, right? this, this one I'm considering. Basically you prefer one act to another if the expected utility of the former is greater than the expected utility, greater than equal to the expected utility of the latter for all probability measures in a set which is picked out by this Gaussian coefficient and which will change depending on the stakes of the act. Okay? Does this correspond? Can this be thought of as, as corresponding to or embodying some sort of pre theoretical intuition? Can I explain this formula to my grandmother in a time that she might understand? Okay? To explain this formula to my grandmother, I have the 
controversial, thorny question of interpreting what it means to have incomplete preferences. Because they're going to be F's and G's, in, ge I mean, in general, they'll be F's and G's, such that neither are G is preferred to F nor F is preferred to G. Okay? Thorny question, lots of discussion in the literature. One relatively simple interpretation is to say, well, if he hasn't got preference between F and G, that basically means the person doesn't want to take a decision. Right? So he would defer the decision if it was possibly... It was if, if, if you had the option of deferring it, right? So I'll interpret incomplete as deferral, or indeterminacy of preference as deferral. Okay. Why isn't this deferral a decision? Well, it, uh, okay. You could rewrite the model with like take. What do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite symbol? No. Okay. Here's here's. Fabio's sausage. Suppose this is the symbol for deferral. I could rewrite the whole thing with adding a sausage deferral symbol and we, we'd get precisely the same formula. So it could be explicitly represented or not. If you want. Okay. I'm just using it. Um, interpretation. Indeterminate preferences deferral or indeterminate preferences sausage. Um, Is it right that if you do that, you can defer deferral and otherwise you can't? Sorry? Is it right that if you do that, you can defer deferral and otherwise you can't? Uh, deferral won't be, uh, evidently, it won't be an act, right? You're going to have problems of, so, I mean, as kind of anyone who's had a look at it, thinks about it for a second, knows you need to be able to identify options between, if you're doing preference, you need, to be, you need to be able to say that if I'm choosing between F and G, and I'm choosing between F and H, that's the same F, right? You're going to have problems saying that when you've got a sausage there, right? So it's going to have some special pr kind of choice theoretic properties, of which I like, I kind of, that would be a little bit of a side issue for this talk, right? I mean, this is why I prefer this sort of interpretation, because it's nice and clean, at least. Okay, so on the basis of this interpretation, what is, what is this telling us? It's telling us that when the stakes are low, this set can be small, so you might have this preference for all probability measures in the set. But when the stakes are high, this set is going to be big, and you might lose that preference. So choices, decisions, no deferral. Decisions you make at low stakes might be suspended when the states get higher. But of course, if G is preferred to F for all probability measures in a small set, it will never have the opposite preferences for all probabilities in a high set, so you're never going to have uh, choices reversed in high stakes. Okay? Another way of saying this is that when the stakes are high, you're really only going to decide, as opposed to deferring, if you're confident enough, if you have an appropriate level of confidence in the relevant beliefs. Okay? Put in a quick a quip slogan, this basically tells you, gives you the following advice for deferral. Defer when the, confident, when the confidence in relevant beliefs is not sufficient to match the importance of a decision. Okay? Ron, sorry, I, I think this is sort of really why Pier Paolo's question is important, because there are these cases where, def I mean, intuitively, deferral will have costs, which are not represented in, in your thing here. So you, okay. it might be the stakes are very high, like climate change, right? <laughs> um, uh, but you can't defer, because... The, the potential downside of deferral is 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 very high too, and you, somehow that's got to be okay. Yeah, I, I get that. So let let okay. Let me say specifically what what, what I'm trying to do here. I, I'm trying to give an intuition for this model. Right? There are many reasons to defer. You can defer because uh, are many reasons not to defer. It could be costly to defer. You could defer because you think you're going to have more information. You could defer because you think you have more information about the utility. The idea here is another reason to defer is because you're just not sure enough about what to choose. Right? This, of course, is a, is, is a model that just looks at one of those reasons to defer. Right? I would need a much more complicated model if I wanted to integrate cost of deferral, if I wanted to integrate what I would do if I wasn't allowed to defer, if I wanted to integrate cost of information and deferral. Right? The, the, the goal here is not to give such a model. I mean, there are ways in which this can be extended to incorporate cost of deferral, for example. There are ways in which it can be extended to incorporate the question of what you would do if you weren't allowed to defer. But that's not the, that's not the aim of, the, of this kind of part. The aim is to give the idea that this can be thought of as a, as a model of specifically that reason to defer. In the same way as you can criticize 
kind of models of, uh, of kind of deferral based on information which don't integrate the specific cost of the, the specific exogenous cost of deferral for not looking at the exogenous cost. That's something that would have to be added if I was really interested in the theory of deferral. The kind of the point is you have a you have a kind of pre-theoretical intuition of what's going on. Your kind of grandmother will say, okay, you could also defer because, uh, or decide not to defer because it's costly. You could also decide to defer because you think you're going to learn something. But yeah, I, kind of, I understand that one reason for deferring is because I'm not sure. And that's, that's the kind of point that comes out here. You have some pre-theoretical intuition. Okay? Even though you're rather pure. And I, of course, I'm not suggesting this is a full theory, theory of deferral. That would be crazy. Uh, and I'm, I would like being crazy, but you know, there's kind of limits on how crazy you can be. Is that a question? <laughs> um, uh, and I would suggest that relatively few incomplete preference, this is something which would require much more discussion, relatively few incomplete preference models have such, a, such an intuitive uh, representation. It can all be a limited to this. Uh, and it is, certainly if you consider the unanimity rule, the kind of Bewley version where this is a fixed set of probabilities, then it will say that if you decide when the stakes are low, you have to decide no matter how, how high the stakes are. So think of that, that you, Suppose that you had a bet uh, where, the utility, where your utility values were plus 10 and minus 10 if you win and lose. Uh, if you multiply that by a million, if you decide kind of to take the bet when it's small, and you, if you multiply it by a million, you would still take the bet. That's, that's something which is uh, okay. Um, and likewise, it would also say that if you defer when, the, the when your stakes are very high, you would have to defer when the stakes are very low. So if you defer when it's plus minus a million, you defer when it's plus minus one. Okay. Um, let's see if this conclusion that we do have some pre-theoretical intuition extends to another member of the family. So once again, another member of the family, we're just going to plug something else in. Maximum expected ut dis utility decision of Gilbo and Schmeidler that we saw the other day. Yesterday, any notion of stakes uh, that applies to acts, we have this, right? This is basically the maximum expected utility formula, except that in Gilbo and Schmeidler maximum, these are constant sets. Here, they'll change, right? They'll depend on the stakes of the acts. What does this tell me? Well, it tells me that um, when the stakes are high, I'm going to be using large sets. That basically means I am going to be relying on fewer probability judgments, the probability judgments that are holding these larger sets. I'm only going to rely on those beliefs in which I have sufficient confidence. Okay? If I don't have enough beliefs to rely on, I'm going to be pessimistic or cautious or careful. Okay. But note that if I do have enough, if I am confident enough in those beliefs, or the stakes are low so it's not so important, I, I'm not going to be very pessimistic at all. I'm going to rely on these confident beliefs, right? So, in a certain sense, my pessimism is only, I'm only as pessimistic as I lack confidence and as the stakes are high. Low stakes, I don't need much confidence. Won't be pessimistic. The stakes are high, but I'm really confident. Won't be pessimistic, okay? In, in kind of, in a slogan, this basically tells us to choose boldly if you have sufficient confidence given the stakes and to choose cautiously if not. And I would submit that this is much more controversial and would require a million, well, a big long coffee stroke lunch to discuss. But I think that relatively few non expected utility roles correspond so closely to plausible maxims of this sort. Certainly, that few are presented in terms of plausible maxims of this sort. And certainly, if you compare this to the max min expected utility role, that does relatively bad. It's been it's often criticized for being way too pessimistic, and this can be thought of as a model that tempers that pessimism by saying you should be only as pessimistic as you are, as you lack confidence, given the stakes, right? Okay? So you shouldn't be pessimistic if it's not very important. You shouldn't be pessimistic if the stakes are high, but you're very confident. Can I just ask on, on the red line there? I mean, I, I can be extremely confident and, and very wrong. Right? And uh, it's often subjective that model, happens. Yeah. I mean, you're wrong because you're very confident. You can be uh, very confident in a belief and wrong. Just like you can hold a belief and be wrong about it. Yeah. yeah but you seem to justify my uh, boldness just because I'm wrong. I mean, it sounds a bit... Um, well, I, 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 I'm not quite sure... <sighs> you see my point, right? I, I mean, confidence I... and being right are... Are not the same thing. Well, sure. they're often orthogonal just... in, in, in a kind of, you know... Um, I mean, are you thinking about the, the literature on overconfidence? Arrogant people. Okay. Uh, so, I might have something to say about that. Can, can, I, can, can we... Can we yeah, sure, sure. Just... I might have something to say about that at the end. Uh, or maybe I, or maybe, or ask me in the discussion if I, if I forget to say. But yes. Uh, but it doesn't mean that arrogant people are irrational. Or maybe, maybe they are. I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem to me that they're necessarily irrational. Okay. 
So um, what would you want from a decision rule? Corresponds to some reasonable pre-theoretical intuition. Doesn't seem that that's very lacking here. Uh, how about the th choice theoretical consequences? So there are, there's an awful lot that can be said about this. There's a whole battery of arguments that we propose. I'm going to want to go um, relatively fast. So I suppose the best way of getting to the, the jugular in inverted commas is just by looking at some representation theorems and seeing what, pr what properties of preferences we have to give up or espouse if we wanted to, 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 to embrace at least part of this family, okay? So uh, I'm going to be using the standard Ansgar-Harman framework. Fortunately, I don't have to say anything, but this is basically kind of uh, a very special case of Cherea uh, Voglio Malachi and uh, Battigliani. Uh, it's what uh, Richard proposed before, so I don't have to say too much about it. I'm going to need the mixture operation. Um, and in the Ansgar-Harman framework, this is something we kind of more or less saw yesterday. This is a standard. Uh, these are the axioms for expected utility. So let's see what we have to give up to get to our models. Okay? So there are two models. One of them is an incomplete model. One of them is the max-min model, right? So let's do the incomplete model first. The first thing you've got to give up to get the in incomplete model is basically the step you need to get to an incomplete model with a fixed set of probabilities. You need to give up completeness. Okay? With whatever that goes with, if you're willing to go that far, as some people are, then you just need to give up completeness. What's the next thing you need to give up? What, what, what's the difference between the model with a fixed set of probabilities and what's specific to ours, the model with this variable set of pro probabilities? I, I think the easiest thing you can, uh, the kind of one, the, the, the axiom that changes most is transitivity. So there are going to be alarm bells ringing, so let me explain what is changing transitivity. The first thing to notice is that in the context of incomplete preferences, transitivity effectively says two things. It says that if G is preferred to F and H is preferred to G, then you have a determinate preference between H and F. The second thing it says is that determinate preference goes in a particular direction. You prefer H to F. Okay? So it demands determinacy and preference. And the weakening we have here is we don't demand determinacy and preference always. When do we not demand it? We don't demand it when these two preferences are held at low stakes and this one is held at high stakes. Because one of the, the guiding ideas is when the stakes go up, we can be less decisive, right? We could defer because we're just not so sure, right? Okay? Whenever these two ha ha hold at a particular, you have these two preferences at a particular stakes level, then this will hold at any stakes level lower. At any stakes level higher, no. So when I mean stakes, here's um, I, I, I don't want to kind of go too much into technical details, but when I mean in this particular case, uh, say you have an act, uh, you have a choice between F and G, and you have a choice between F and H. I'm assuming there's a relation, which is a stakes relation, which says says that uh, this one has higher stakes than this one. Okay, uh, I haven't said anything about it because this basically works for any choice of stakes. So you, you also minimally need that if uh, if f is less than or equal to g and g is equal than h, then you don't get a reversal between. Yeah, what I was going to say is it comes out from the other axioms. You don't get a reversal. It comes out from the other axioms. That you don't get a reversal. Okay. Because if you had a reversal, you would be contradicting other axioms. Yeah. So one of the one of the consequences, one of the kind of takeaway points is what I'm really allowing is a little bit of indifference. I will never get reversals. I will never get uh, acyclic preferences, and I don't need to add that as an x axiom because it comes out from the rest. I had a similar doubt about uh, the stakes. Uh, so, so if you could just elaborate one second. Is it the primitive of the problem? Of yeah, the, it is, yeah. Okay. In and, this particular model. And uh, can I... Def can I see the following that I'm going to propose as a particular case? Like, if uh, G dominates H state by state, I can say that FG uh, involves higher stakes than FH. So I will define that binary relation on the board in the following way. Whenever G dominates state by state H, F comma G involves higher stakes than F comma H. That won't deter, if you don't have cases of determination, it won't give me... If I don't have, sorry. 
Suppose you have, suppose you have a case where there's no state-by-state -state, uh, domination. That's not a full definition of the relation. Ah, but I will use um, the usual trick, no? By identifying, uh, when I mean state-by-state, -state, I will just look at f of s, g of s, right? Or in this case, g of s, h, s, and I will say that f, g dominates state-by-state -state h if g of s is prefer squiggle to h of s uh, for h, s, and yeah. s. I, tell me if this answers your question. I think you can, you can pick states relations such that whenever the state by state dominance of G over H, then this is going to have higher stakes, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's is, not... It's a specification of... of but it, what, I, what I'm saying is it's not full specification, because you need to tell me what the relation would be in cases where you don't have state-wise dominance. Ah, but you need it to be completed, the stake uh, relation? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a ah, okay. It's a okay. I, okay. There are generalizations where it's incomplete, and there are generalizations where it's not even a, a weak order. Okay, yes. I'm, I also tell you why I ask this question, because if you allow for such incompleteness, basically, yeah, I can see a similarity with Lair, Tepper on justifiability, and I was wondering, because I could see it conceptually, hmm. now I see it a bit mathematically, so yeah. I was so wondering. That's a very good question. They have a much weaker uh, weakening of transitivity. Right, because they're basically going to have, they're using probability tre thresholds, right? And you're going to have probability problems of kind of, you can have, uh, you can have f is preferred to g and g is preferred to h, both for a probability greater than 0.7, but the kind of, the union won't be probability greater, greater than 0.7. We won't have that sort of thing here. It's a slightly different structure because we don't have that additivity. And it's related to the fact that in the second order, we don't have the additivity, which they have. Okay. Um, that's basically, that's basically the difference. It kind of percolates through to the other axioms. So, as I said, uh, transit, transitivity can be read as saying there's determinacy and it goes in a particular direction. So, the, the version of independence we need is a version that says independence holds whenever both preferences are determinate. Okay? Right. Uh, it doesn't, if, if this holds, I'm not going to demand that this one holds. Okay? Uh, notice that this is similar enough to independency to get past dynamic consistency problems. So a standard way of getting past dynamic consistency problems in the philosophical literature is by moving to incomplete preference models. So this model is not going to have problems with dynamic consistency. If you are worried about dynamic consistency and you like that way out, that's one way out. Okay? Um, one final thing, uh, one final... Um, one final axiom has to be added, which corresponds a little bit to our maxim, and I'm not going to put in formal terms because it's a little bit complicated. Basically, or no, it's not actually, it's not that complicated, but I didn't put it in formal terms anyway. It says that when the stakes decrease, one cannot suspend determinate preferences. If you've taken, if you're, you have a preference here, and the stakes decrease, then you hold on to that preference. The inverse direction doesn't hold. Okay? Uh, so, um, that's more or less enough to give you the representation theorem. Just note, given we're interested in representations of belief, that you have the appropriate uniqueness the same as you would in the Bayesian model. That's kind of important if you are interested in the philosophical question of norm of uh, rational belief representation. And it doesn't seem that the step you've taken from the Bewley model is that big. I mean, you're basically allowing certain cases of indeterminacy justified specifically by this idea of state. Okay? And you don't have problems with dynamic consistency. Okay? So, choice theoretically, not many bad things are happening here. Let's have a look at the other model, where, of course, you're going to have to get rid of independence, the, the careful preferences, the max min version. Let's see what the main difference is uh, here, right? So here we have to move through, this is going to be a generalization of Gilbert Schmeidler, so Massimo more or less presented everything that needs to be presented about Gilbert Schmeidler yesterday. Um, the important axiom for our purposes is this C independence, okay? What does the C independence axiom say? It basically says that if you have preferences, then whenever you mix those preferences with a constant act, not with any act as the standard independence, but with a constant act, you hold on to those preferences. As Massimo said yesterday, this basically corresponds down in the functional form to some translational in invariance and positive homogeneity. So if you take a pair of acts and you shift them up or you shift them down, if you squash them or you stretch them, you're not going to affect the preferences between them. However, at this point, of course, your grandmother is going to be jumping up and down. Because if you take a pair of acts and you squash them or you stretch them, you shift them up or you shift them down, you go between bets where the stakes are 10 utility units to bets where the stakes are a million utility units, you are, of course, changing the stakes. So this is absolutely unacceptable from the point of view of someone who thinks that, uh, kind of accepts the intuition in the maxim that the higher the stakes, the more confidence is required. Okay? 
So we need something weaker, and the, the, what we're going to use is more or less what the, our maxim tells us. Basically, we're basically going to say that whenever you shift or, or squish or translate or whatever and act in such a way that you lower its stakes, you can never evaluate it as worse than it was evaluated before. You can only ever evaluate it as better. Okay? You can't be more pessimistic when you lower the stakes. And similarly, when you squish, translate, whatever, and act in such a way that you raise the stakes, you can never evaluate it better, right? higher stakes, you can only be more pessimistic. Okay? That and just uh, kind of a few notes on the monotonicity and uh, uncertainty of version axiom to specify them so that the stakes are the same, they apply when the stakes are the same, that basically gives you this representation, once again, with the same unique. So from the point of view, once again, the step between Gilbo and Schmeidler, and this is relatively small, and motivated. Okay? So just to sum up, on the choice theoretic uh, properties, I, I might jump the next slide, on the choice theoretic properties, I would, I would say two things. One, the strongest argument for expected utility does not, does not cut down the whole class because some members of it can survive that argument. And two, anyone who's willing to take the step to set the probabilities, there's not really much reason for them to take, take the step beyond and go to, uh, there's not reason, much reason for them not to take the step beyond and go straight to confidence. Uh, to the conference model I'm proposing, the conference release. Okay? The, you can get a Dutch book argument as a, as a special case of that, which is for philosophers, but I'll jump over it, okay? given that time is getting. Um, 10 minutes, okay. Uh, third thing about, uh, third potential advantage or disadvantage of a decision rule, conceptual clarity about the role of different things. And I promised I was gonna say something about the cautionous coefficient, so let's say something, right? We know how we, inter uh, we interpret the utility function, desires over outcomes, incorporating risk attitude if you want to. Uh, conference ranking, the whole point is that's supposed to be a representation, a proper representation of rational beliefs for an agent uh, who can incorporate confidence in his beliefs. So what does this cautionous coefficient correspond to? Well, I'd like to suggest that it can be thought of as, um, as an attitude to, cho to choosing in the absence of confidence. And I think you can see that in the representation itself. I think you can see that in the representation itself. So let me just explain the idea before I give the kind of a, a slightly more bolstered formal kind of representation of, uh, idea. So what does this cautionous coefficient do? It relates the importance of the decision to the confidence level which is appropriate for that decision. So it can be thought of as a taste or a desire or an attitude to taking decisions of that importance based on beliefs with that level of confidence. Right? In slightly more philosopher's language, it can be thought of as a value judgment about the level of confidence which is appropriate to those sorts of decisions. Okay? If you don't like the intuitive take on it, we can do a non-intuitive take in terms of comparative statics, which is relatively standard in this sort of literature. So we take some sort of comparison between decision makers which seems to be of the taste sort. So for example, in the, in the case of the incomplete preference model, we can compare two decision makers on the basis of how decisive they are, this is relatively standard, and that basically ends up corresponding precisely to differences in this cautious coefficient. Similar things can be done for the ambiguity model. I'm going to go relatively fast because I'm running short of time. But basically, the comparative statics gives the sort of the answer that we would expect. We can, this basically corresponds to attitude to ambiguity or attitude to decisiveness. Good, so we do have a clean separation between beliefs and desires. Uh, in the case of incomplete preference rules, uh, I don't know if many of those models have such a separation. Certainly, the Bewley model doesn't. In the case of non-expected utility models, some models don't have that separation. Famously, the maximum expected utility model. Equally famously, the KMM model that we were talking about this morning definitely does. Okay? So, on looking at two members of the family, we had three types of criterion, right? Some sort of pre-theoretical intuition. The, the fact that when at Sunday lunch your grandmother asks you, what have you been doing for the last year, you can at least explain in words that you don't need to start writing something down on, on the napkin. Um, Neat separation of the different attitudes so you can get a clear idea of what's going on and uh, not particularly unreasonable consequences for choice. Nothing disastrously bad. We ha seem to have all of that for two members of the family and it doesn't seem to be any reason that for, any, for other reasonable members of the family we wouldn't have that. Okay? Um, I don't... Do, do I... How much time do I have? Do you, not much, really. Okay. But uh, we had a discussion already. Okay. Uh, how, do I, how do I interpret? Seven minutes? Can we negotiate in seven minutes? I, I don't know whether to stop. For, okay, I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about the, the consequences for decision making. Why not? This is going to be a little bit perhaps out for some of the audience, but, but hey, why not, right? So how would we use this model to decide? 
What, uh, and in particular, I'm going to be interested in this new element of the model, this attitude to choosing the absence of confidence, right? Because um, I think that although the way I sold it to you and the way kind of I came to it was by brute force formalizing the maxim that the higher the stakes, the more decision, I think that it has some, oops, it has some perhaps interesting consequences for debates, per, for example, in, in, in philosophy and perhaps elsewhere, right? So what it, what it is, is a value judgment. Remember that these, this is belief, so it can be thought of as a judgment of fact if you're making a public decision. This is utility function, tastes, or a value judgment. This, we said, was tastes or attitudes, so a value judgment as well. So it's a value judgment about the, extent, about the level of confidence which is appropriate for particular decisions. And what it implies in particular is, for specific decisions, the beliefs used in a decision may depend on the stakes involved, but the beliefs themselves, by which I mean beliefs and confidence, the beliefs don't. Okay? And this is in fact relatively important because there's a growing literature, I mean, going back perhaps to the 50s, but particularly active nowadays, going under the title of pragmatic encroachment in philosophy, where people suggest that beliefs are stake dependent. Whether or not you know something depends on the decision in which you use that knowledge. Okay? So, Brad Arment suggests something similar for degrees of belief. Fantel McGrath, Stanley, Hawthorne suggest similar, have written books on the similar sort of thing for knowledge, right? This suggests that that's all based on illusion. This gives a diagnosis of how that works, right? The illusion that your beliefs or knowledge well, depend on the stakes involved in the decision you're using them is based on two facts. One, you have beliefs and confidence in beliefs, okay? two elements, something which is obviously ignored, and that stays the same. That can only be affected by information. Two, the choice of the appropriate confidence level for the decision is a value judgment. That bit is a value judgment. You can, we've separated out the value judgment bit from the fact bit, right? Uh, two things which are conflated if you don't see that confidence and beliefs is an important part of beliefs, and that this is a value judgment. Okay? But this is important, might have something to do with something to say about certain interpretations of the uh, precautionary principle. So this is uh, a, an off-cited version of the precautionary principle, which is, in fact, called the precautionary approach in the document, but we're not going to get into the kind of, kind of the, the legal complications of precisely what it is. Three sorts of interpretations of this principle have been proposed, right? One thinks of it as a decision rule. Whenever there's a threat and an uncertainty, bang, immediately we have to have some sort of precautionary action. One thinks of it as a rule of dialogue. Well, you're not allowed to use certain sorts of arguments in certain sorts of situations. The final one, uh, Sven over Hansen, for example, Martin Peeson seem to be attracted to this sort of position, um, or at least at times have suggested attraction to this sort of position, uh, in, in, interprets this as a rule for belief. Says that uh, when the stakes are high, Believe the worst, even if you don't have any reason for believing the worst. Right? This is obviously related specifically, precisely to the, the sort of thing I was talking about. And we're going to have, we kind of diagnose this as an, an error because the beliefs you actually have are independent from the beliefs you use. Um, and I think, in fact, so I think, in fact, you can, I think that you can underst understand or you get a, a different interpretation of the precautionary principle on the basis of the model that I've been proposing here. Okay, so what, what does the precautionary principle say? say? It says something like the following. It says, when there are threats of, of um, serious or irreversible damage, so lights are flashing, we're talking about stakes here, okay? Full, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason, right? Often discussions are, are put in terms of rejecting or not null hypothesis. One way of interpreting this is as, the, is, is as following. If you can't reject your null hypothesis, you might have some sort of default, you have no reason for not holding on to it. You might have some sort of default belief that it's there, right? Because you still have to work on the base of some belief. In the context of our model, you're going to have a certain level of confidence in that default belief, right? What this seems to be saying is, when the stakes are that high, we're going to require a level of confidence that's higher than whatever level of confidence you have in your default belief if you haven't rejected your null hypothesis. What is that saying? It's basically associating a level of stakes to a level of confidence. So you might say, where does this uh, cautionless coefficient come from if we want to make a public decision? Well, it looks like the precaution principle is telling you precisely specific values. It's, it's basically giving the sort of value judgment you, you, you need to apply the model that we've been proposing here. Okay. Have I less than seven minutes? Just. Okay, thanks.
very much. Brian, we have time for some questions. Richard, yeah. Yeah, so about sort of cautiousness, it seems like there are now at least three different places at which cautiousness can sort of come into one's thinking. One could build it into the utility function itself in the, in, in, in the form of risk aversion. One can build it into the decision rule by going for something like maximum EU. And now you've given us a third way in which we can be cautious, and that's by working with very large... So, um, do you have any sort of thoughts about whether there's there are kind of consistency there's a fourth conditions? And fifth way as well. No, 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 not about. But, but whether there, there's any sort of constraint on these things, whether there's a danger of double counting, uh, um, get, getting too. You know, if you if you have a cautious decision rule, you better not have too cautious a co coefficient for your beliefs and so on. It seems and the worry here. It's very vague, but there's a sort of vague worry that you can you're commitment to a kind of formal cautiousness can drive one into a sort of substantial cautiousness which is very harmful in, in making decisions. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. But I'm not quite sure there are three places because as far as I understood your talk, the chance risk aversion is supposed to be different from the sort of cautiousness you have because of lack of belief, right? I mean, I thought you were trying to draw a line. Well, yeah, so risk aversion in the, in the goods themselves and the risk aversion of the chances. Which has taken us some sort of cautiousness. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah. Um, if you don't like downsides, if you don't like downsides, it's kind of, sorry, yeah. if you don't like downsides, some in some sort of vague sense, right? You could build you could build your dislike of downsides relative to potential upsides in these various points. Okay. And, um, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm just worried about the overall coherence of, of these things. That if you just if you build some disliking of negative consequences. Okay. Um, All three levels, you, you might become really irrationally cautious. Yeah. My, my intuition is that you probably will have a different discussion between every, every level, right? So this is was supposed to be an entirely subjective framework. If you're kind of working with objective chances, then that you can kind of say, well, objective, subjective. You, you have reason to put it. If, if it's really the objective chance you're worried about rather than the subjective, that's one thing. In this model, um, I suppose you could put it in the cautiousness coefficient, but, but that's really going to be your attitude towards your uncertainty, so to speak. Whereas there's kind of difference between your attitude towards uh, how, much, how much you use your uncertainty, how much, you kind of, how much confidence you require in the decision, and what you do when you don't have enough to decide. Um, and I, I think that probably what we're in a situation where the... Um, preference data we have is probably not going to do much. I mean, we can get representation theorems that we probably we can distinguish them. I mean, the difference between cautiousness and the cautiousness coefficient and in the decision rule, I can distinguish in representation theorems. That's not difficult. I'm not quite sure whether we can get good preference data on that. Um, I do think it's a normative question, uh, which would have to be based on normative uh, normative arguments. It seems to me that there are two separate. So one thing is, I don't want to base my decision on stuff in which I'm not sure. The other one is, if I don't have enough beliefs to make a decision, then I act pessimistically or I act optimistically or I take some mix. Those seem to be two different directions, at least for, for this model. I have to think a little bit more about the obje objective chance. My question is related to the last slide. So in case of the, in which the stakes is very high or the decision is very important, for instance, in case of environmental change or adoption of uh, nuclear energy and so on and so forth, it might be the case that the level of knowledge that the individual uh, should have to decide uh, between the possible alternatives, uh, it's not sufficient, and so uh, the confidence should be, could be shifted from the confidence in... Uh, uh, in its own uh, belief to the confidence of uh, other beliefs because uh, one people could think that uh, uh, he knows anything, uh, nothing about a problem, and so he decides to delegate others to choose. And so we can, we can think that when the stakes uh, uh, grow or when the, the, when the decision is very important, maybe uh, the, the individual uh, should have a, a certain level of knowledge to... to um, I know, to, in order to make the decision, because yeah. otherwise you can delegate other, and so 
the yeah, to the extent that such delegation is possible, that sort of intuition is entirely compatible with with some of the stuff that's gone on. So some of the stuff that's gone on here. I mean, the other talk I would have given about the relationship between confidence and belief formation, of course, would have related confidence to the amount of information naturally. Right? That's kind of uh, the nature of that relation is, in fact, let's say, a very interesting question of which much can be said. My question is about um, stakes relative. Uh, you're just trying to resupply to the stakes relative uh, literature. Most of those, uh, Stanley and Hawthorne's discussion, they're assuming a fixed utility, and then that's what's being manipulated. But there are other considerations that might, that, that I wonder how you would reply to. So one example of which is in the causal um, modeling literature, there's a distinction between uh, prediction and intervention. All right. So you might, uh, you know, have a causal, fixed causal model, and you're talking about what are the proximate causes, and your beliefs, your attitudes about what causes what will change depending upon whether your the task is to predict uh, something or to what you need to intervene on. So one possible reply to this is saying, oh, okay, well maybe there are different utilities that are associated with this, and then I want to aggregate into my main utility function. If, and I guess I'm wondering, anticipating a reply, if, if that's the route you would go, or would you acknowledge or try to distinguish between uh, uh, practical considerations aside yeah, I mean, from the stakes being adjusted? I, I don't know the causal, this causal literature at all. Uh, but it sounds relatively similar to some of the literature you have about, for example, um, the um, kind of uh, the criteria being more rigid or being more uh, demanding for a belief to enter into a scientific theory than for it to be used, for example, uh, in risk management. Th that's not the similar. Well, ass assuming it's sufficiently analogous, the reply I would give is perhaps for a prediction, you, uh, prediction is, is, is a lower stakes activity than intervention, uh, and that would basically mean that you're going to be using different beliefs sense the larger sense for intervention than prediction. I'm not quite sure. I, it's kind of difficult for me to say, given that I don't know the, the causal modeling literature, but we can talk about it after. That's good. Thanks. Yeah, I would do it just in terms of stakes, not in terms of utility function. Okay, let's thank Brian again.